So you might have figured this out already, but I'm a little bit of a fish geek. I mean, I know I'm being really subtle about it. I wasn't always a fish geek. As Jeff says, I used to be a journalist, and then for a while I was an analyst in the nonprofit space, helping foundations figure out how to dig into complex systemic problems. But about four years ago, the fish came and found me. And they found me through a project where I was asked to map this really thorny, complex issue of sustainable fish. And in doing that process, I identified this compelling opportunity that seemed to be perfectly suited to some of my strengths. You see, we decided that what we really needed to do in the seafood industry was recruit more entrepreneurs and more innovators to help us end overfishing. I'm all over that. Because it turns out that the instincts that you need to find great entrepreneurs to write about them for a magazine are exactly the same as the instincts you need to find great entrepreneurs and recruit them into a business accelerator that helps them scale their ideas and scale their companies. And that's what I do with Future of Fish. But I'm kind of one of the least likely folks to be a fish person. I am deathly allergic to shellfish. <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest, and so I never saw the ocean for the first time until I was 18. And I get seasick just looking at a boat. <laughs> so as I started this work, I was aware that there was a gap between who I was and who I needed to be to make the difference that I could in the world. And so what did I do? I got on the boat. And that is not a metaphor. <laughs> Um, I went to Alaska, and I found out just how dangerous and difficult it is to be a fisher. I did not expect it to be that cold in July. Um, I also was unprepared for, see that bottom photo, the round thing hanging on the wall? That's a toilet seat on a hinge. You flip it up, put the bucket underneath it, and voila, there's your commode. So perching on a bucket in rough seas to do your business is about as fun as you would think it is. <laughs> And even more fun is that after that, you get to pick up the bucket and go up on the deck and pitch it overboard in front of the rest of the crew. Yay! <laughs> Gives a whole new meaning to that expression, the poop deck. <laughs> so I also learned how to head and gut a fish and fillet it. And I went to China, where most of the world's processing is done, no matter where the fish is landed, because labor is so cheap in China that it doesn't matter how much gas we spend to go all the way around the world and back. I'm not the only one who's taken this unlikely path to the oceans. I want to share with you a few stories of some other ocean geeks who are here with me at SOCAP. This is David Lang. A year and a half ago, David's startup had tanked and he was living in his car. And what David decided was that what he really wanted to do, what he was really good at, was making things with his hands. So he made an underwater robot. And then he started selling kits of underwater robots to other people who were then sharing and collecting the video that they took of the ocean. His company, OpenROV, has started a movement of citizen explorers. Right now, hundreds of citizen explorers are working on open sourcing the ocean. That's freaking cool. It's Jacques Cousteau meets Wikipedia. And that happened because David decided that the ocean needed a maker. This is Samantha Lee. Samantha got tired of using her insight around marketing and branding for dot-com, so she quit. And with a couple colleagues, she founded a company called Village Fishmonger. And this is a business that helps urbanites understand what it means to have sustainable, locally caught fish. And after one season of working with local fishers in New York City, she has over 300 subscribers to the community-supported fishery that she set up. And that happened because Samantha decided that the ocean needed a marketer. This is Barton Seaver. He's a trained chef. And Barton decided that his culinary knowledge and his storytelling ability would be a way for people to really understand the impact of overfishing the oceans and understand it through a lens of dinner on the plate. So he started a sustainable seafood restaurant where what he featured was the catch that came in every day off the boats from local fishers. And there was a day when no fish came in from the fishers. They didn't catch anything. And so Barton made something delicious out of the bait. 
and he sold it for $24 a plate, and he sold out of that entree. He's that good. Martin is now the director of the Seafood Sustainability Program at Harvard University's Public School of Health. Hundreds of thousands of people have purchased his cookbooks, have read his articles, have attended his speeches, all because Barton figured out that people needed and were hungry for story as much as they were hungry for fish. So if I can become fish lady, and if I can become a fish geek, then there's really no reason in the room why some of you can't think about how does this integrate into the work that you do? What sorts of skill sets can you bring to the table to look at ocean acidification, plastic pollution, sea level rise? The ocean track is designed so there are, it's chock full of people who are trying to help you figure out where is the hole in the system that is perfectly your size? It won't necessarily be easy, but I also guarantee that no one will ask you to sit on a bucket. You have an opportunity to repay the ocean for what she has given to you, to your family, and hopefully to your children's children. Breathable air, bountiful food, boundless mystery and wonder. All you have to do is get on the boat. <laughs>